Well, welcome everybody and thank you for taking the time to be with us today on our webinar. Today's webinar is being brought to you by UC Irvine Extension and today we're going to be talking about how radiometry can ride to the rescue. This is related to a lot of the programs that we offer here at the university in optical engineering and optical sciences and we'll talk a little bit about some of those courses as well. Uh, but before we get going, just wanted to let you know a little bit about how this webinar works. Uh, we do have the audio lines on mute uh, to cut down on the background noise. So use the, uh, the chat area and the Q&A area uh, to, with any questions you might have uh, along the way, please feel free to ask questions regard, just re related to anything at all, uh, you know, careers. We get a lot of people on these webinars that are looking to change careers, that are, are looking uh, for more technical details in particular areas. Uh, please feel free to, to use the chat area, which should be right about there. Uh, you also have possibly a Q&A area right about there on the right side of your screen. If those things are not visible to you, then use the little tabs way up at the top here off to the right. I can't pull them down because they're off the screen on my, on what you can see of my screen. Uh, you pop those little tabs. Also, you see Eric uh, under UCI listed as one of the panelists. Uh, you could chat directly to Eric uh, with any questions or issues you might have with the, the audio uh, or the WebEx uh, software itself. By way of introduction, my name is Dave Demas and I'm the Director of Engineering and IT Programs here at UC Irvine. I'm also on the faculty in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, you've got my contact information and you've also got Jennifer Spitzer who's our program representative in this area a program manager in this area. Sorry, Jennifer. Um, we're a really good resource, especially Jennifer. She uh, talks to a lot of people in a lot of different places in their careers. Uh, we get people on these webinars that are just coming out of school. We get people and trying to find a, figure out what job they want. We get people on the webinars that are unemployed and, and need to you know, help finding money to, to finance further education. Um, and, and we talk to a lot of people on, and we get good career guidance because we're plugged into the industry. We have advisory board members uh, like our speaker today that are plugged into the industry and, and we watch other people's careers and, and as they move through these programs. So please, if we can help at all, because one of the things that the University of California you know, does certainly is undergraduate education and, and a lot of great research. Uh, but one of our other goals is to develop the workforce so that uh, people are employable uh, and to help with that career guidance that goes along with that. And that's one of the, the missions of what we do. So please feel free, whether you end up taking a class from us or not, feel free to uh, utilize us to help you move on in your career. Well, we're really fortunate to have Barbara Grant with us here today. Uh, Barbara has uh, been uh, prolific in this industry for a long time. As you see there at the top, she's written uh, one of the best-selling um, books in uh, the Field Guide to Radiometry and the Art of Radiometry uh, just recently, you see there, last few years. She'd been teaching for a long time in this, in this area, uh, both at the SPIE uh, conferences and uh, other uh, major institutions, of course, like Georgia Tech and Santa Clara. Uh, for those of you that uh, are new to, to optics, uh, uh, one of the, the premier optics uh, research areas or research schools is the University of Arizona where, where uh, Barbara got her master's degree. Uh, very, very um, uh, focused uh, set of research going on at Arizona in a variety of optical sciences and it's a, a great place to have graduated from and, and go to if you're in, interested in moving on. Uh, and again, one of the things we'll talk about a little later is we have some short courses here at the University of California that kind of lead up to some of this stuff, including uh, one that uh, uh, Barbara will talk to. Uh, right now, Barbara has uh, got her own consultancy company. company. Uh, it is uh, uh, Lines and Light Technology. Uh, and before that, as you see, she worked both at Lockheed Martin and at NASA Goddard. Uh, and, and Barbara, just uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. We're uh, we're honored, and uh, uh, I'm, what I'm going to do now is uh, move it over. So uh, hopefully, I'm going to move over to your slides. I'm going to give you the ball. Bear with us just a second. Yes, and I am now the presenter. The presenter, and hopefully your slides are there. Can you see them all right? Well, let me click. 
I see optical engineering. No, that can't be it. I see panelist B. Okay, and up at the top, actually, mm -hmm. uh, right up at the top where it says, you see some tabs where it says mm -hmm. uh, optical engineering, and then one of them says rides. I just titled it very shortly. Sorry there. You see that? Click on that tab yes. called rides. Click on it. Here it is. Yes, I, I have it. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So we should okay. be able to see. And, and Jennifer, everybody, just make sure that, uh, you know, let me know if you do not see Barbara's slides with the blue background. Okay. That should work, Barbara. We see, we see your slides. Okay. That sounds great. So I will take it from you, Dave. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dave, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you so much to Jennifer, to Eric, and to everyone who's attended today. And uh, the subject uh, that I'm going to speak to, Radiometry Rides to the Rescue, is in fact based on a true story. And uh, let's get into that. It will show us a great deal that we can apply to our design process. Well, months before a nationally critical satellite is scheduled for launch, some engineers raised a red flag and said that the instrument's channel that we are going to be using for navigation is not collecting enough signal from a star to perform its function properly. Well, this is catastrophic. If you can't navigate, uh, your mission is going to um, disappear. But the management of the program is listening to the engineers, which is very good, and so a variety of tests are performed to resolve the issue. This is a teaching opportunity then, or an introduction opportunity, for me to go over some of the subject areas that I will be teaching in my course. And the vantage point is the integration and test phase of a major project. And as, uh, as many of us know who've been working for a while, there's so much to do with design at the outset, but eventually your system has to be built. And uh, my goal here is to try and uh, provide some kind of uh, feedback loop, actually, so that what we learn on the test floor can enhance our uh, process of design at the outset. Well, uh, here was something that was very interesting that, that did occur. We, uh, there, the target that I uh, mentioned here on the right side is actually uh, right here. It's called a, a spec star. And someone decided that uh, what he was going to do was to take a, a device called a Pritchard photometer and uh, point it outside uh, at the star or that type of star at night. Well, in doing so, he came up with the result that, hey, we are not going to uh, get enough signal to be able to see the star. But is that true? Uh, the fact is, we had already tested this imaging device, this imager. It's a radiometric instrument, and it has a, a spectral, measured spectral response over the band. And that uh, instrument uh, gave us the result that things were going to be okay. But all kinds of things can happen uh, when we go into the integration phase of the project. So even, um, even if we're confident, it's wise to pay attention to concerns. Now let's look at this instrument here, this one called a Pritchard photometer. Well, it's a photometric in instrument. And one of the things that you will be learning in my class is the difference between radiometric uh, terms in units and photometric terms in units. And in photometry, and uh, I know that many of you are working in a wide variety of disciplines, in photometry we uh, talk about the photopic curve, that is the eye's response to light. And um, we're going to get into the discussion of calibration in my class. And as I said, this photometer was calibrated using stars, but not uh, up at a, at a high uh, level observatory. It was calibrated at sea level, so the atmosphere comes into play. So if any of you happen to be working on satellites or anything having to do with imaging through the atmosphere, please be assured that this is another uh, part of the problem that you will have to consider. 
Well, how did we go about solving the problem? Uh, as you could see, we had two different instruments that produced two different results looking at the same star in two different conditions, unfortunately. Well, the first thing that we wanted to do is to get an idea or to get a model of what kind of signal we are going to get out of each instrument, the photometer and the imager, when it examines a spec star. And the way that we did that was we took a spectrum of the particular uh, spec star and the, the measured or known responses of both instruments, the photometer and the imager's radiometric channel, and we basically performed a convolution that would allow us to see the signals expected from each instrument. And we can see that the photometer's response here and the imager's response here. Well, there's actually a lot of information in a plot like this, because what it's telling us is that there is a great deal of signal that from the star that the imager is going to see that the photometer would never pick up it in the first place. And so when you look at something like that, uh, you say, well, yes, I, I can understand why the photometric instrument would uh, produce a result with a lower signal to noise ratio because its response, its spectral response, does not cover a great deal of uh, what might be expected to be picked up. So it would have been very, very nice and very, very helpful if before uh, an elaborate test was arranged, if people had uh, done some of this modeling. And this applies directly, I'm sure, to many of the problems you're involved in. And although this seems trivial, our first bullet point here, it is actually very, very important. Before you get into the design process, it's a great idea to figure out what the end user expects to measure, image, or detect. It seems obvious, but sometimes it isn't. Hello? Oh, it seems obvious. We're Pardon? We're, we're all here. Did you okay. I heard you. May I continue? Yeah, you, you go, you go, Barbara. Sorry, it must have been another uh, audio interruption, but we're good. Okay, great. Um, so I know that uh, if we're on the design end of things, we're not necessarily focused on the end user. That may not be you. It may be someone else in your company. And if that's the case, uh, really do your best to try to get good information as to what your either your end user, either a client you know, or a user client that you expect expects to see. Uh, secondly, this would also be obvious, but unfortunately overlooked a certain amount of time. Model the expected instrument response and see how it compares to the phenomenon that you're trying to detect. And at this point, when I make that statement, I'm actually talking about uh, work that can actually be done before you start uh, going into an optical design program. I uh, have a certain amount of experience, and, and what really has been helpful for me is to do some, uh, they used to be called back of the envelope calculations. They're all done by computer now. I tend to use spreadsheets a lot, and uh, the basic idea is that you will have some kind of, of guidance in terms of what you expect to see before you even enter a detailed design. Uh, bullet point three is very key for the course that I will teach. There are differences between radiance and irradiance, and luminance and illuminance, and distant and extended sources. You may not have heard, depending upon where you are uh, in your studies, of these particular, um, of these particular topics, but I can assure you they're very important. In fact, uh, in 1985, uh, when I was working in uh, Silicon Valley on a project, uh, these very, very educated scientists and engineers were working hard to figure out the difference between radiance and irradiance, because although they had gone through PhD, several of them, this had not been a part of their education. So uh, you'll be able to learn that and uh, and learn that well in my class. 
And finally, units and terminology, which we will be going into, are common areas of misunderstanding. And so is calibration, which leads me to the next point. I think that when we are beginning our designs, it's important to consider how we're going to calibrate them. Now, I have a, a background, as Dave mentioned, from the University of Arizona, uh, where my thesis work was focused on radiometric calibration. And I realized that not every instrument uh, will have an absolute calibration. Sometimes you're doing a relative measurement. Sometimes you are imaging and you don't need an absolute calibration, but if that's the case, then you still have to make sure that it is going to perform as expected. And at the beginning of your design process, not somewhere close to the end, figure out how you are going to test and verify your results. This is a cost-effective way to do your design well and save your company money. Well, in our example here, as I've already mentioned, our two different instruments were calibrated differently. So again, that speaks to the importance of understanding units, terminology, and your expected signal. Now, so much of what we do in optical engineering has to do with good practice, whether it's good design practice, whether it is a good validation practice, integration practice, test practice. We want to be very wise and make sure that, that our job is being done right. One of the uh, truly interesting things that, that happened in this particular program was uh, we had some calibration checks uh, done as the imager. If you can imagine this scenario, there's a, a high bay, it's called a high bay, where you have several satellites in various stages of integration. So it's a huge room, the lights are on. We think that uh, our situation is dark, where we're putting our test source here on the left, right up into uh, our imager. But on closer inspection, our device wasn't exactly uh, at the aperture of our test source. So what that meant is that room light was coming into our test setup and, um, and aliasing the result. And when you're talking about a, a hugely important satellite, this is not a good thing. And I think that uh, sometimes people, when they hear something like this, they can say, well, gee, how would this ever happen? Wasn't anybody in charge, et cetera, et cetera. But let me point out that um, very often in real-world situations, when you are struggling, when you're trying to get something done, when the designers are long gone and you uh, are on the test floor trying to make something work, what would seem obvious when you're sitting at a back room or a conference table isn't necessarily uh, going to be replicated exactly. And that's why we have to be uh, very wise to the problems, the practical problems that can creep in at various uh, stages of our process. Now, I ask a question down at the bottom of this slide. Can we use an extended source to calibrate for irradiance measurement? I'm not going to go into an answer to that question uh, at this point. I wanted to ask the question simply because we're going to be talking about extended sources, irradiance measurements, radiance, when we learn the terms in units, and we'll be able to answer a question like this at the end of the course. So in order to solve our problem, we're developing a strategy where we are going to uh, test uh, both our imager star sense channel and the Pritchard photometer against the same source. But first, both instruments will be recalibrated. So we're, that, uh, that's kind of a sidebar. We made sure that we calibrated them well. And both are now going to be looking at the same source. And this is a source that will simulate the navigation star. In order to provide the answer to the question, is there going to be enough signal to detect the star on orbit? Now, we're going to be in that same high bay, but we've put a dark tent in there. And we're simulating a star with a particular source 
uh, placed inside a collimator. However, when we brought uh, our measurement contractor in to make the spectroradiometric measurements, and if you don't know what those are, you'll learn it in my class, we found that uh, our signal uh, from our four different quadrants of this uh, test collimator was actually different. Uh, their irradiance values were different. And what this meant, basically, was that the test equipment that we were using, that we paid someone else for, was not well designed. So that's not uh, quite a good thing either. In fact, we could even see a portion of the actual light source looking into the collimator. And I'm sure that uh, you all, being good optical engineers, if you do your uh, designs, you don't do this. But sometimes it happens, and sometimes it's not the designer. Sometimes something happens uh, as you're putting something together or shipping, and something is not quite right. So, you know, could we have used a different design, not a centrally obscured system? It doesn't matter. Uh, there's no time to build or order another collimator, and we have to make do. And the lesson learned from this, of course, is again, think of your testing, think of your calibration, think of your users at the outset, and as optical engineers, uh, it's a good idea to try to establish as much communication uh, with these other engineers as possible. So we, we did our best at, uh, at making measurements in a difficult situation. We used the photometer to sample the beam at several locations in each quadrant. The imager measured the full beam. Its, uh, its aperture was greater, it was able to do that. And all the measurements were repeated several times. So we're pretty much, uh, we're doing the best job that we can under a difficult circumstance. And fortunately, uh, the winner is the imager. And what I mean by that is we were able to ascertain through this test and measurement process that the imager would have enough signal to noise to be able to see our spec star on orbit, and therefore it would allow the satellite to navigate properly. The other thing we did, and we will get into this in my class, is that we also considered and attempted to quantify all the sources of error in our test setup. And I'm going to be talking about this uh, in the course, but there are two major types of error. Some of you may be mathematicians and you may be just geniuses at the subject of error, but there are certain types of error that we can reduce by repeated measurement, and there are certain types of error that we need to account for or remove. And uh, they're, they're called random and systematic respective, respectively. So um, this is a, a subject, again, that, uh, that we will get into. But the bottom line here with respect to our design process is that we need to have a strong understanding of radiometry and photometry as well, I'd add, laws that govern, govern radiation propagation, technologies that are very important to us, uh, sources, materials. When we understand all of this, we will have the tools to design a great product. And I'm very uh, hard over on this bullet point too. It's important to design with the characteristics of the anticipated phenomenon in mind. And that is true whether you are uh, sampling uh, a signal from a star, whether you are going to be imaging the skin in medical applications. I'm actually uh, fairly interested in that, uh, being able to do non -in a lot of non-invasive testing of the skin. And um, it's important to be able to think about the end at the beginning of your process by incorporating calibration strategies, if you are doing calibration, or test strategies as you begin your process. So I've uh, quickly listed then the, uh, the following topics that I'll be discussing in the course. Again, they are radiometric and photometric units and terminology, optical radiation propagation, the approximations we use and the laws, sources of optical radiation and their laws, 
properties of materials relevant to radiometry. I'm going to be introducing the subject of optical radiation detectors and in a general way introducing systems and delving into their figures of merit because you can learn a lot uh, from taking apart figures of merit and seeing what kind of performance uh, you can expect if you hope to measure or image. So, oh, and calibration, yes, let's not forget that. So that is uh, basically uh, my overview to the course. And uh, oh, uh, by the way, the, the imager didn't just win on the test floor. Uh, this was launched on a uh, GOES weather satellite and it worked swimmingly. So it, it was a happy ending. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Barbara. It was uh, that uh, well, always good to, to end on the happy ending. But uh, just so you guys know, again, what what we do as a part of this pro pro program, we have a, a related program in optical uh, uh, engineering and optical instrument design here at the university. Uh, what we do is we 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 look at where there are um, gaps in the um, education that uh, levels that people need in order to get. Uh, certain jobs within industry. So we look around, we talk to industry, and we ask them what uh, kinds of subjects uh, people need to know uh, to be hired at the various uh, engineering and design companies. And that's where we came up with the, the original program, but it's also where we came up with the idea to add uh, uh, Barbara's class uh, because as we go through these courses and we teach some of them, people say, well, what about these other subjects? And, and this was one that came up on our list. I'm going to switch the ball back over just for a couple seconds and talk a little bit about some of the other uh, things that we have is, uh, by way of support for optical engineering and optical instrument design at the university. Again, we do have two certificate programs. We're not going to go through the details. You can come onto our website. Uh, if you are interested in uh, some of the other courses or building up uh, a little bit more of a resume in this area. Uh, very, very strong area in general uh, as far as uh, job demand. Uh, regardless of where you came in, you might have either mechanical engineering or physics or different backgrounds, but you find yourself doing a lot of optics. Uh, what we then did is we said, hey, we, we heard from the employers. They said, we're just not finding people with the right skills. They're coming out of college with general background. So we filled the gap in between those uh, people that are coming out of college and then what industry is requiring with these two programs. One of them is optical engineering, and the other one's optical instrument design. And they are very related. Uh, all of the courses in the program are online, like Barbara's will be. Uh, online courses uh, don't mean that they're not tough. There's still regular courses, regular stuff every week. You're listening to the lectures, discussing stuff with uh, you know, the other students and faculty uh, in the classes, they're turning in assignments, running software. Uh, you know, you're doing a lot of work. It's just that you can schedule that work pretty much any time during the day, at night, on the weekends, uh, and it's much easier to get things done. The programs are pretty short. You know, they're meant to just fill the gap. They're not meant to be a master's degree, but they're meant to be very uh, specific industry uh, information that is helpful to get jobs and to stay current. So you can see here, there's uh, just a couple required classes and then uh, a few uh, elective courses, depending on which, which, which of the two programs you're looking at. Uh, the instrument design is the second one. And what we're going to do is switch over to the, uh, the curriculum itself. Just real quick, for people that haven't had much optics at all, we, we have some prerequisites that um, you can come into in geometrical physical optics. If you have that information in a, either a physics class or other plays, you can jump right into the introduction to lens design. The ones that Jennifer has marked here in yellow are the ones that will be offered during our next quarter. And we are the University of California. We are on the quarter system. So our next quarter starts in January. Quarters are 10 weeks long. And you see both, uh, both programs here. This is the set of required classes for optical engineering. And these are the two required for optical instrument design. Now, one of the questions that just came in was, well, how much uh, do I really need to, you know, take all of these and commit to everything all at once? And uh, the answer is no. The, the, uh, you come in and take, if you want to take classes, you need to take classes, you take whatever uh, courses you need. 
uh, one class, two classes. The way we structure them is in terms of a certificate, and that's what you see here. So we have elective and required classes. If you did decide that, hey, after I took a class, uh, I said, oh, I, you know, I can take one more, and then you say, oh, dude, I only need two more, and I can finish out a certificate, uh, then you let us know, and we, we put you on a, a candidacy form, charge you a little fee, uh, and then when you finish the last class, uh, we put the certificate, we mail you a certificate, and then we also, of course, put it on your transcript. Uh, but that's not required. The, the, this is not signing up to a master's degree. These are short little courses. You take any that makes sense for you and your career. Uh, now, that was the uh, elective, uh, I mean, sorry, that was the, the required courses for the two programs. Again, the two programs are the optical in engineering and the optical instrument design. And here are the list of electives. And what we were just talking about were this one, which is Barbara's class in radiometry. Uh, you see it listed in two places here because it is an elective, like many, that could be used for either of the two uh, programs that we have, uh, the two certificate programs. And you also see a few of the other uh, uh, courses that are listed in both areas. Uh, metrology is, is listed in both areas. So there's, there's quite a bit of overlap between these programs. And if you did want to move on and try to get both these things, you want to talk to us a little bit because there's certainly some overlap, make it a little bit easier for you to do that. But for most people, you know, you take one, one step at a time uh, and, and take a single class and see how well that works for you. There are a lot of fun classes in here uh, besides what Barbara was just talking about. Uh, things like lasers and fiber optics, which are really key, and just some of the, uh, the basics, the optical, optomechanical systems and optomechanical uh, design uh, are all part of these two programs. All right, well, let me just get back, because I know, and we got Don on the line too now, we want to get back to a couple other questions that people had related to how do I get jobs and, and I'm not in the industry. So we'll get to those in just a second. But one of the other questions that always comes up is, well, how do I pay for this and how much does it cost? Courses are anywhere from about $695 to a little over $700 for a course. And be careful with that because often people in other schools will, will quote you a per unit price and uh, per unit prices can be, can be similar. These are per course, uh, a relatively uh, good bargain from the University of California here. Uh, but uh, the question is, how do you pay for them if, uh, if your employer doesn't uh, fund you? And for many people, employers will fund these courses. They are University of California credit courses, so employers often will, uh, will pay for them. Uh, usually they want to be your better, but uh, they usually will pay. If you're in a different situation, maybe you're in between jobs where you're unemployed, uh, this next slide is important for you. That is the way to get some money. Uh, this is called the Workforce Investment Act or the Trade Adjustment Act. And these are both ways that you can get money if you are unemployed to get some retraining. And the nice thing about these programs is they pay for the entire certificate program. Uh, again, usually about five, $6,000 if you were to finish out the whole thing, including the books. And they pay for it regardless of whether a month later you get a job because these programs are meant to, to you know, take one class at a time. They're meant for working adults. So most people take like a year, 18 months if they finish out the whole program. Well, the Workforce Investment Act pays, again, that entire time, even though most likely you're going to get a job in between that period of time. Now, the way you get this money is you go to the unemployment office here in the state of California. The unemployment offices are called one-stop shops or one-stop centers. And if you're down here with us in the Orange County area, uh, one of the uh, ones that uh, we like to go to, there's several of them, but the one closest to our campus here at Irvine is the Irvine One-Stop Center, and it's by the Spectrum. Very good place, by the way, for all sorts of resources if you are in transition, you are unemployed. Uh, please, if you haven't gone and you're maybe already getting your pay, your uh, unemployment benefits, please stop by the, these places. They, again, a lot of good resources, but they'll also be the ones that can qualify you for those Workforce Investment Act funds or the Trade Adjustment Act funds. It does take a little time to get through the government bureaucracy, but uh, it, it, is, it is well worth it. Only difference is the bottom one 
is for people uh, that have had a job loss due to that job being moved overseas. So both of those are really good for people that are in that situation. We also often have people on the site, on, on the uh, web, webinar, that are students who are coming out of school and thinking, eh, you know, maybe I need a, a few very specific skill sets in order to get the jobs that uh, are out there, which is, which is true. You know, people don't hire a mechanical engineer. They hire somebody that need to help them uh, design optics or design embedded systems or design something fairly specific. If you are just coming out of school, another source of funds is AmeriCorps. And again, because this is University of California credit courses, all of these programs, AmeriCorps, workforce investment, loan programs, uh, will, all, will all work, uh, again, because it's University of California course credit. AmeriCorps, again, is probably best for people that are uh, students that are willing to give a little bit of their time and uh, in, in trade for that time. Um, AmeriCorps will give you some money towards further education. Another nice thing about AmeriCorps is you're going to get out there and do stuff, you're going to volunteer, and that's a valuable thing to have on your resume too, because as we'll talk about in just a minute, uh, you know, networking is key to, to getting, getting jobs, and uh, you know, that, that is a great part of AmeriCorps. And if none of the above work, there are certainly always loan programs. Again, these are relatively small amounts compared to maybe your undergraduate degrees. Uh, but uh, these programs are all uh, accredited to uh, be able to uh, get loans for any of the courses that you're taking. Now, we talked about this before, but if you were to take the entire program in optical engineering, be just under five grand, and uh, if you were to take the entire program in instrument design, it'd be just under four. There's some books, obviously, and books are about 100 bucks each, but not each course has uh, required tax. There's some uh, lab fees. You're, you're actually going to buy and use some software industry standard software, ZMAX, and, and other tools in these in these courses. Uh, but that gives you a little bit of an idea. We mentioned this already. The typical course is in that range, and again, that's per class, not per unit. Uh, one of the other things we want to remind you, for those of you that are in the area or even outside the area, we also bring these programs into corporations. Uh, so if you've got enough people out of your organization that need that, then uh, we will certainly do that. And Brian, down there in the middle of the page, is the contact person for that. Now, we're going to take a couple of your questions. I know that Don just logged in, and I'm going to try to bounce you over, Don, so you can speak as well. Let me get you over as a panelist. Uh, and Don, if you don't mind uh, uh, dialing in so you can help me on a few of these other questions. Um, and you can uh, do the same as well, Barbara, but uh, some of the other questions were related to, you know, getting jobs. Um, it looks like we've got um, a question from an undergraduate saying, hey, I don't, I, I don't know where to start as far as my job search uh, to, you know, to, to get into this industry. I like opti optics. I've had a few uh, classes, uh, but, but how do I, how do I start and take my first steps into this? And, Barbara, if, if you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about how you got into the industry and what were some of your first steps. Well, uh, you know, it's very interesting. Of course, I started a number of years ago, and I uh, had my only actual skill was computer programming. So uh, that, however, was very valuable up here in Silicon Valley. And I got a job uh, as a computer programmer, but I happened to have fortuitously been placed on a project where radiometry it was important. Uh, now, however, there are a number of paths that I would suggest. I know that in uh, your area in Southern California, the medical uh, aspects of optics are, are very important. And uh, up here in our area of Silicon Valley, there's a lot of new and different products coming out through uh, companies like Apple and Google. So here's what I would do for somebody uh, wanting to get into something having to do with optics. I would find out which companies make products incorporating uh, optical instrumentation. And I just mentioned uh, a couple. Apple has some. Uh, Google, with its uh, Google Glass, has some. And then start going through their websites to look at the job descriptions. So I would uh, 
I would first uh, target companies, then look at their job descriptions, and that will give you a focus uh, as to how to proceed. And one more thing that I would mention, if you are interested in applying your knowledge of optics to uh, aerospace, there is kind of a, a commercial space industry called new space that is uh, becoming uh, more and more prominent. And a lot of that is occurring in California. So I would uh, check that out as well. Thanks, Barbara. And it's always interesting. And, and Donna, I'm going to come over to you in, in, in just a second to, to give us uh, you, you, your thoughts as well. But one of the, one of the key things that uh, Barbara mentioned is, is also getting out there. Uh, and, you know, when you're looking for jobs, uh, you know, you, it's a job itself. And, and you, you, you certainly need to uh, look at the industry. And one of the things I would recommend if, if you haven't already done so, if you're in that situation, Honestly, even if you're in transition and looking for another job or you're a, a new graduate, uh, you want to use the libraries. You're here at the University of California, there's some really good libraries, uh, databases. Hoover's is one of them. Um, but uh, you can go search on uh, medical product companies. Uh, you can also use things uh, here in the Orange County area. There's the, uh, a, a periodical um, called the Orange County Business Journal, and they list the top, you know, 100 or so employers, and, and, and they uh, break it down into different uh, industry bases. You know, medical products is very strong. Aerospace is, uh, was strong. It's still okay, but it's a little bit weaker than what it used to be. But you can use those lists to, to find the companies. And you can do the same thing regardless of where you live. There's usually some kind of a local business journal and certainly the large databases that will allow you to say, hey, I want to find all big companies that do biomedical or all companies that uh, are of a certain size and within 50 miles of my zip code, right? So you get a, a, a set of data. You find, you know, 50 companies that, that you wouldn't uh, mind uh, working for that were when, within the radius that you would want to drive. And then as Barbara mentioned, you start researching, look at, look at their websites, look at what they're hiring for, look at the skills they're hiring for. And, and don't be scared because especially the new graduates, they're going to be asking for the, for the moon in, in any of these job descriptions. Uh, you don't have to have a 100% match to their job description. You know, be, be bold. You know, go in there, uh, you know, if there's a slight uh, mismatch or things that you're missing. But if there's too much, uh, then that's where, you know, we come in. That's why we built out these programs and these courses is to give, uh, you know, a little bit more of the depth of that resume that might be needed in order to apply to some of those jobs. And, and Don, I'm going to switch over to you for a second. Don Silverman is uh, one of the founding or the founding advisory board member for these programs and has been actively involved in uh, as president of several of the local societies. Don, can you give us a, a little uh, uh, color on some of the local industry societies and, and their meetings? Because that's another key part of that networking. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I think you can all hear me now. And uh, Barbara, thank you very much for uh, coming on, uh, taking on this course, and sharing all your insights and uh, for your webinar today. Uh, thank you. Regarding, you know, it's 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 really an honor to have you. Um, regarding uh, some information about the local um, optics community, uh, particularly in Southern California. Uh, of course, uh, one of my favorite uh, societies is the Optical Society of Southern California. And for those of you who uh, might not have heard of that, the website is www.ossc.org. And, and they've been very supportive of the program here in optical engineering and optical instrument design. On that website, uh, there are, uh, there's a corporate member list uh, under membership. And there's probably uh, over 60 companies, in, uh, mostly in Southern California, uh, Los Angeles, Orange County, and uh, San Diego areas, and also the Inland Empire to some extent. And uh, these companies, uh, obviously, they're all uh, working in the optics uh, field. Uh, there's quite a variety uh, from uh, both the uh, uh, small entrepreneurial ship companies to uh, large uh, aerospace companies and uh, precision motion companies, and also there's some information about some of the local universities there as well. Uh, some of the companies are uh, just represented in the area by uh, sales and applications offices, like the office I work for. Uh, but there's also companies that have um, that are hiring uh, now or might be hiring next year. 
uh, with uh, engineering and uh, manufacturing, production, quality assurance types of groups. So there's a lot of diversity. And um, so that's another great place to look. Also, uh, SPIE, which is the International Optical Engineering Society, uh, there's a link to uh, that website on the Optical Society of Southern California website, as well as the IEEE Photonic Society and the Optical Society of America. So those are some of the biggest international and national societies, as well as uh, the local group. Um, and so there's a lot of ways to network. And speaking of networking, the Optical Society of Southern California is having a meeting tomorrow evening, which is advertised on the home page of their website, at uh, University of California, Irvine. So if you're uh, on the line now and you're uh, thinking about doing something tomorrow evening, and if you're physically located in Southern California, then that's, uh, that's an option for you. And, and a lot of it is about networking and meeting people face-to-face. -face. And when you're doing that, you know, if you go to an event like this or another similar event later on, uh, you know, make sure if you're looking for a job, bring your resume, uh, talk to people about the courses if you've taken, if you're taking a class uh, through the UC Irvine program. Uh, that typically gets people's attention. Uh, and um, so that's a very good place to, uh, to start. Is that good, Dave? As always, Don, we're wonderful. Yeah, and again, guys, we cannot overemphasize that, that kind of the live meeting. Uh, especially for the younger kids and sort of the digital native groups uh, that are used to bouncing around with Facebook and, and, and that maybe go in and use LinkedIn, which is a very valuable tool. But, you know, you, you don't want to just be cyber stalking people that you haven't actually physically met before. The key is physically meeting them. And, uh, it, and it does not have to be somebody that you've known for, you know, 10 years or two or three years. You know, just having a, have dinner with them at one of the society meetings maybe even just a, a short discussion with them of where they, they know you a little bit about where, where you're going. Once somebody's done that to, you know, with you, 10, 15 minutes of discussion, they, they get a sense of who you are. And many times that person would be willing to uh, you know, guide you a little bit and possibly even you know, pull your resume out of a stack and, and put it up a little higher because they've met you. So please uh, feel free to uh, utilize some of those techniques. I think they're quite valuable. And I think we, some of the related questions uh, we also would, would have the same um, uh, response to for those people that are uh, been out for a while uh, in, in their careers and want to do transitioning. You know, maybe they've been out for 20 years. Sounds like the other question was in a similar situation where somebody had been, uh, you know, in, in a particular engineering field, worked at Boeing for a while, things are uh, slowing down at Boeing with C-17 dropping off and some other things, so they're looking to, to transition. But the same thing is true. You know, getting into those uh, meetings, especially in areas where you don't already have good set of contacts, and building out those contacts. One of the biggest things that we could advise for either category, and honestly, even if you do have a good job, it's very important to continually nurture that network. And uh, the, uh, the advice for the people that are coming out of school that are looking for jobs is to give yourself a target. Make, make it a number like say, hey, I'm gonna go find 20 new people in the industry that I wanna go into. And in this case, we're talking about optics. And I'm going to get 20 new people that, that have met me uh, and talked to me a little bit uh, that, I, that I know and, and, and add them to my LinkedIn network over the next 30 days or give yourself some very specific goals and, and do that every month and, and give yourself a six-month goal of having, I don't know, 200 people, new people uh, in your network. And that kind of stuff can be really valuable because going back then when you're looking at getting a job at a specific company, you drill down into your network. And, and maybe you don't find somebody that, uh, is, that you've met directly in the, that, that is working for a company that you want to uh, apply to, but maybe one of their friends uh, does. And, of course, you've got that uh, leverage effect of, you know, you may have 100 people in your network, but each of them have 50 or 100 uh, which gives you a lot broader preview of all the potential people that it hit. So one of your friends might have somebody that uh, is at the company you want to work for. Then you ask for an introduction. And again, you don't ask for a job. You don't, you, you don't put any pressure on them. You just say, hey, to your friend, can you introduce me to the guy that works at, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, Newport Corporation? 
uh, and just tell him, you know, I'm thinking of working there. I'm looking to transition into this industry. Would he be willing to uh, have me go buy him a sandwich at Subway or something? And even when you go have that happen, and again, you pretty much want to talk about their career, a little bit about what they, how they got to where they went, uh, then you have them as a friend again. And, and later on, the next week or next month, then you say, hey, I noticed that there's a job opening there uh, at Newport. Uh, you know, would you mind telling me a little bit about it? And that connection alone uh, is, is the way people get jobs, guys. It is 60%, 70% of all jobs are through some connection. But the key is, again, it does not have to be somebody you've known forever. All right, uh, let's see if, if there are any other questions that come in, either technically. I don't see, I don't see anything else at this point, but please... This, uh, just to remind everybody, the webinar has been recorded, so you guys will get a link back if you need to get back to um, our phone numbers, uh, either Jennifer Spitzer or myself. Yeah, you can also uh, just come to UCI, Google UCI, and uh, go to under Extension, and you'll see all these programs with uh, contact information there. Uh, so please feel free to utilize us, regardless of whether you if you take a class, great, but e even if you don't, please use us. We're, we're here to help, to help careers, uh, people move forward in their careers. And with that, I just want to say thank you, Barbara, very much for engaging. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, you're me, welcome. Give a great little story. It was wonderful and very well presented. And thank you to all of you guys for taking time. I think for most of you, that was probably lunch hour if you're on the West Coast here. Uh, we really appreciate that. And Don, thank you for dropping in as always and everything that you do for us. It's, uh, uh, we're not worthy. We're not worthy. And with that, just have a, have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks again, Barbara. Thanks again, Don. You're very thank welcome. You, Barbara. Talk to you later, You're very Dave. welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye.